my name is Joseph Trapanese. I'm a film composer and music producer here in LA. You could call me Joe. That's totally fine. Um, and yeah, just happy to be chatting with you. Okay, so my first question for you here is growing up, what did you want to be? Oh, yeah. You know, I um, I was not sure I wanted to be a musician. You know, I, uh, I, I at first, well, the first thing I, I think when I was like, two or three or something i said i wanted to be a truck driver well, i guess probably more four or five but um <laughs> but then eventually i wanted to fly planes or like design planes i started like going looking into like engineering and stuff like that um but then it was it was interesting my friends were all playing in the school band and it, I, I wonder if you have a similar any similar stories but you know I just wanted to hang out with my friends and I played some instruments I played piano and trombone and eventually that just got to be so much fun I had so much fun playing with people and making music and I I what basically happened was that happened at about the same time uh, my uncle lent me some VHS tapes of Star Wars and I watched those and I was like wow this is amazing what is that sound and i fell in love with the sound of the orchestra and i started learning about what the orchestra was and how it works and how to arrange music and and it was around when i was 13 14 i was really just so into it that i really decided i think i think this is what i want to do um but you, you know it's funny i think everyone has such a different path you know there are so many people i know in this business who didn't want to be film composers who were like you know, for instance, uh, I have uh, a friend who, you know, they were going to, they were just repairing instruments and just trying to figure out what they were going to do, or they were going to be a singer songwriter and that sort of thing. And just kind of scored some films for a friend or, or maybe they were just making weird electronic music and a filmmaker was like, Hey, I want you to make music for my film, you know? So it takes all types to do this. And there's so many different paths. I feel like for me, it was like a very traditional path in that I knew I wanted to become a musician by the time I was like almost in high school, finishing high school, went into music school, came out of music school, got an internship with some composers in LA. And then that kind of slowly built into my career. So pretty traditional, whereas I know, I know a lot of people who like, by the time they're 25, 30, they still weren't sure what they were going to do and just kind of fell into film music. So it's just very interesting, especially the arts. So anyway. Well, you talked about Star Wars. Are there any other scores that inspired you growing up? Um, yes. You know, after Star Wars, you know, it, it I started really getting into um, electronic music, you know. So I actually, I really like Clint Manziel's music, like uh, Pi, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, like I really love Clint Manziel stuff. Um, and then, you know, you can't, no one can really ignore the music of Hans Zimmer, you know, where he really was one of the first people to treat the orchestra like a rock band, you know, so um, obviously, you know, you, there's like John Williams and Hans Zimmer are, are so different in the way they treat the orchestra. And then as I got older, I really started enjoying like more minimal music like Vangelis and John Carpenter. Um, and even I found like Jerry Goldsmith's music to be like kind of surprisingly minimal when you looked at what he was doing with the orchestra. It wasn't trying to be so complicated. You know, one of my composition teachers out here in L.A. was looking at this film cue I was writing and was like, oh, you're you're working too hard. You know, I was writing all these notes. And I started looking at Jerry Goldsmith and yeah, I mean, there might be a lot of notes on the page, but he was, he had some really simple ideas going is really straightforward. So I don't know. I don't know how to think of that. Maybe I'll let you see if you can synthesize all that in your head, but it, it's interesting. I feel like I'm a product of so many different ways of thinking about music and I'm slowly trying to find my own way of thinking about music. Mm -hmm. Well, you said you, you went to school for music. How did you work your way up and get better at what you do over the years? Well, you know, so much of it for me was about not being the best. Uh, and I still feel like I'm not the best. So I'm always kicking my butt trying to get better. I, I think, you know, when I was in, in the band in school, I was definitely never the best musician. So there were better musicians around me that I learned from. And I eventually got to be better and better to where I was really good in high school. But then when I got to college, you know, I was from, um, I went to public school. Jersey City, like 
growing up in an urban community, um, it was very rare for someone like me to go to a conservatory like Manhattan School of Music. Um, and so there were a lot of students around me who were from much better, I don't know, better is such a subjective term, but like much more a better pedigree of musical training, like great, amazing private lessons for all their life. And, you know, already been in all sorts of youth ensembles and orchestras and all sorts of lessons. And I really hadn't had that much. I, I was lucky that towards the end of high school, my parents got me some like a great composition teacher. I had a great piano teacher that really trained me to be able to get into Manhattan School Music. But once I got there, you know, everyone, it felt like I was one of the worst <laughs> worst musicians there and so just being in that I think just kicked my butt to really like um get better and better and I spent a lot of time in the library like studying scores I it's interesting now that I'm older and or now that technology is better it's amazing how many scores are within our grasp but even in the early 2000s when I was in college you know every uh you couldn't get scores online really like you can now. So you, I was in the library a lot. And I remember the library would have listening stations and you'd sit down and put in the CD and listen to the music and read the score. And I feel lucky that I was kind of forced to do that. Whereas now there's so much grabbing our attention that even though the resources are out there, it's harder to kind of sit down and like really focus. So it'll be interesting to hear, are you going to, are you going to go to music school, do you think, or is it? I'm going to school for acting, but also I'm going to be working on music at the same time. So that should be so it. I, I want to interview you in 10 years and see what your, your, your school experience is like. Cause it, it, it is interesting. I, I don't know what I do in college now with I mean, obviously we had the internet. I didn't grow up in, in a cave, but, uh, <laughs> but, but it is very different uh, 20 years on from when I went to college, so. How did you first get into the industry? What was your first job working? Yeah, you know, I got so lucky because, and I think everyone needs a bit of luck, right? That's kind of how, I'm sure that's something you've heard a lot. Uh, you know, you need a bit of luck, but obviously I came to LA, you know, I came to a place where I could get lucky and I also put myself in a scenario where I had, you know, I'd gone to school, I had a certain amount of tools. And so all that kind of translates into luck, right? You get, you go to a place where you can get lucky. You have already put in a lot of study, so you have skills and then that's how luck happens. And for me specifically, I knew my family would be a little weirded out if I just got up and moved to Hollywood. So I, I applied to UCLA. I got a really good scholarship to do grad work at UCLA, which is awesome to, and, and that also gave me a sense of community. To be honest, that was actually one of the best things about going to UCLA is not, not just that it's a great school, but that there's a film program, there's a music program. I made all these new friends in a, in the, in a new town. I didn't know anyone here, basically. I knew a couple of people, but it was great to immediately know people. But literally the same week that classes started, I started an internship and I, I made, I made it a goal of mine that summer to just apply to internships at studios. And, and first of all, that's a lot harder than it sounds. It's hard to find out about the internships. And then once you start applying, I found out that I was one of 40 resumes that came in. And I feel like that's low. I know I've heard of studios getting a hundred, 200 resumes. So the fact that a, I found a place to apply, B, my resume went to the top of the list. C, I interviewed and they liked me and gave me the internship. All of that is so lucky. But I got so lucky to the point that I almost, I almost dropped out of school because that internship got me so busy and I was making and delivering music, not necessarily as a composer, but I was arranging. I was, but I was also doing coffee runs. I was doing music copying. I was cleaning the studio. I was building Pro Tools sessions. And I like to say that, in that internship, I'd learn more in one week than I would in, you know, a whole semester of school because being in a studio is so different. You know, you, you're talking about acting. I imagine it's the same thing if you, you know, from obviously there's a craft to acting. So you're going to go learn that craft. But your first week on a real set is going to be such a different experience than all that school you did. And, and so that's what it was like for me. And I was just so fortunate that because of the training I did. Plus, and this is a big elephant in the room that when I mentor students, I, I, t I tell them like, you need to be a great collaborator. You need to be a good friend. You need to be a good human being because when you're in the studio, 
you might be working 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day with these people. You're going to see them more than they see their kids, their family. And so you want to be a good person and helpful and easy to get along with, easy to talk to. So I think not only did I have a skill set, not only was I young and cheap. I mean, that's another thing too. I was new to town. I was getting paid like 15 bucks an hour, which is like so low for like living in Hollywood. It's like nothing. I had like weekend job to like help me pay the rent, you know? So like, you know, all that stuff being young, working for cheap, but also having the skills, having the aptitude to learn. I just, I listened a lot. I learned a lot. I would try to, I would write everything down. So I got things right. Um, All of that plays into the fact that, hey, there's this guy, Joe, he was really helpful. Maybe he could help you. And that first internship kind of parlayed itself into other apprentice positions and and assistant positions that over the next couple of years, I eventually got a recommendation to Daft Punk. I got a recommendation to Chris Beck. I got a recommendation to these projects that really kind of made people more aware of who I was artistically, not just who I was as a person. So, you know, that's why I like to say, I feel like I have a very traditional story that like, you know, I started here and it kind of gradually built itself, but even then it was like kind of a zigzag. I worked with all sorts of different musicians, different people and forward, backwards, left, right. Um, But there are people with even crazier stories than that. But anyway, that, that's, it was, I was really lucky to have a story like that. Kind of similar to what you said about mentoring students, what's the biggest piece of advice you would give to somebody interested in becoming a composer? You know, you you have to be open to different ways of learning and storytelling. So for instance, I have interns come through the studio all the time because you know a it's a great it's a good way to mentor people, but b it's a great way to like help yourself at the studio. It's helpful to have someone who's gonna go, go run an errand or go clean the studio. And hopefully they're getting just as much from us by learning from me and my team. Um, But the, but the thing that I see that I see that's a problem for interns most often is when they come in thinking like, I just spent $200,000 on an education and I know how to do it. And they, you you know, they want to do it and they want to do it a certain way. Whereas, you know, there's that famous line in uh, Star Wars, right? Yoda says, you have to unlearn what you have learned. And that really is, I think, part of the process of becoming a professional is learning how to take all this knowledge that you've acquired and being able to com- compartmentalize it and keep it ready for when you need it. Um but also be ready for new things and be ready to change the way you think. And that's kind of, you know, I actually spent this morning with an amazing musician who's a specialist in medieval instruments. And I had not, you know, that's something I've been meaning to do more and more of lately, spend more time with musicians. And, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to produce this new score I'm writing with a certain type of quality, with older instruments, with quote unquote period instruments. And there's so much that I've learned that I need to unlearn in order to be able to approach this type of music, as well as tell this story, deal with producers. I mean, another great piece of advice that goes hand in hand is I got, I got a great, and I didn't, I didn't say that I didn't invent this. Someone said this to me, said, Joe, you're no longer in the music business. You are in the movie business. So it is your job to understand how movies are made and adapt to that. So rather than asking filmmakers, well, you know, what key do you want this in? What type of instrumentation do you want? You know, that would be awful. No one would ever work with me. It's my job to meet them where they are. So I have to, when I sit down with a filmmaker, when I sit down with a producer, when I sit down with an actor, even I'm trying to meet them at their level so I could help them tell their story. It just happens that I'm a musician. So I'm going to try to listen to them and hear them out. What story are you trying to tell? What, uh, type of emotions are you trying to get from the audience and then it's my job to figure out how to deliver that musically and a lot of that is not only learning like how to produce how to record all that stuff how to tell story but it's also unlearning because you learn in school you learn in 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 class in a very structured environment where it's like this is the way you do this this is the way you do that and yes that's great that's going to be really helpful to you but there are going to be times where Z comes before A and two plus two equals 400. You know, there are going to be times where things just don't make sense. And 
and and the traditional way of doing something you're going to have to rethink how to do that because modern production modern storytelling is so different from classical you know so so you just have to be ready something that i like to tell people is like creativity storytelling ideas like that's where hollywood makes its money that's the magic of hollywood the magic of hollywood is ideas and creativity and problem solving and um a lot of school is about history theory knowledge all great all very useful but you have to be able to translate it to storytelling to creativity to ideas to 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 uh being a good storyteller really that's that's what it is and going back to what you said about like working with producers and actors and directors, what does being a composer entail for you? You know, I, to me, it, it's funny. Maybe I'll say something I've never really thought about in a way. Like, I feel like I'm the liaison to music. You know, I am the connection to how this production is going to be going to use music. And sometimes that means I'm purely a composer. You have a film, you've edited it you need it scored like su such and such style you hand it to me i deliver that but i try to make my job a little bit more creative than that a little bit more compelling like for instance i'm working with a friend right now we've already worked together so we have a, a shorthand we text each other we're close and so i said hey listen i, I just want to write some musical ideas about the film even just based on the script as you're shooting. And he and the lead actor are so excited about that because I've been delivering music as they shoot. And so they're like listening to music sometimes on set. He said they were shooting a scene like maybe to a rhythm of, of the music. And, you know, that's obviously one way of doing it. Another way is I'm working on a production um, where there's a singer on screen. And like, so I need to provide music and I need to think about the instruments that are going to be on screen. That's always fun, always a unique challenge. But basically, to sum it up, I feel like I'm the music resident music expert and I'm trying to help them help them use music to the best possible ability um, to deliver their story. And sometimes that means barely doing anything at all like hey you just need like a little sound here a synth a violin whatever let's just get it done in a very minimal way other times it's, hey i need you know let's get a 90 piece orchestra we need a choir we need this we need a band from new orleans we need you know and i think that's what's so exciting about what i do is it's so rich in the toolkit i get to play with in the sandbox it's not just it's not just i'm working with an orchestra all the time or a string quartet or whatever. It really is whatever I think of and can afford, obviously, within the budget of the project. And then based on, I also talk about casting a lot where I might see a movie or read a script or hear a story and I might immediately think of a musician or an artist I've worked with or someone who's going to give a voice to something that, hey, let me call up that musician and ask them to work with me on this theme or whatever, you know? So I think there is, there's a lot more to being a film composer, I think, than there, than just sitting down and playing a theme and say, hey, here's the theme, you know, here you go. I, to, to me, it's an all encompassing, really exciting artistic journey. What would you say is the biggest challenge of your job versus the biggest reward? Okay. Yeah. I think the one of the biggest challenges, you know, to be honest with you is, and I, I don't want to sound like this is what I'm trying to do, but it, it really is like keeping everyone happy. And again, I, I, my job isn't to make everyone happy. I know that like my, I try to think of myself as an artist first and a producer second, where I'm going to go make some crazy art and then figure out how to produce it into the movie, how to make it actually work. But oftentimes you get into scenarios where you're dealing with a one of the producers doesn't like the score or one of the, you know, and sometimes you can get fired and part of it, you have to be willing to let go of your job. If you're pursuing art in it, you know, focused on making the filmmaker doing something great. And I've been fired. Every film composer has been fired, but sometimes you have something so beautiful, so artistic and, and, and there's one producer or one studio person or one uh, that makes it really difficult. So you have to figure out a way to, protect the art and keep it 
sacred and amazing and awesome, yet still run the gauntlet of Hollywood, which is dealing with notes, dealing with uh, different egos, dealing with different personalities. Um, so that is certainly a big challenge. And that's something that, and the reason I say it's the biggest challenge of all is because for me that it involves things I can't control. You know, it, I can control the musicians I hire. I can control the type of music I'm drawing upon or the type of rhythms or whatever. There's so many things I can control. And I'm going to try to take every little thing I can control and, and harmonize it all together to make something amazing. It then becomes really complicated when there's that one person or something we can't control is like, well, yeah, I don't like it. It needs to be more like this or it needs to be more like that. So that's where things can get a little sideways and more difficult. I think the most rewarding thing for me, you know, there's several points that are really rewarding about what I do. One of them, obviously, is when I get to record with live musicians where there's a life happening there you know people always ask you to oh will the synthesizers or will the samples replace the musicians and i don't know maybe in a hundred years the ai will get good enough that you know it can really replicate the magic but but there really is magic in the room where you have musicians playing you know if you think of an orchestra say it's a small orchestra 40 people and the average age is 40, which is pretty young. There are a lot of people playing music who are in their 60s, 20s, whatever, you know, all over. So let's just say 40. And so you figure, let's say all the musicians started playing when they were 10 years old. So everyone has had 30 years of musical experience. So in that room, 30 times, four, you have 1,200 combined years of musical experience. Plus you have, you know, cellist. One of my cellists plays on a 200-year-old instrument, you know, so you have all these old instruments, some new, which is totally fine, which are new instruments can, are just as good as old, but you have all these different instruments playing together, all this experience, and every millisecond that goes by in that room, these players are adjusting to one another, where that cellist is, oh, you know, I'm a little out of tune, let me tune it this way, and let me, you know, I need more pressure on the bow to match what the trombones are doing so that it can really harmonize with this way, so, so there's like Every millisecond, there's a, a thousand decisions being made. It, it, the music just comes to life in a way that no matter how hard you work at a mock-up or a sample of that music, there's so much life being imbued by these musicians that that is just truly magical. Even if you just write a bunch of whole notes, you know, oh, here, just C major chord, whole note. It sounds amazing because there's just so much life happening in that room and it's vibrating the air molecules of this room that's hitting the microphones and being recorded in a way that is just, that's the movie magic. And, and it's hard to repeat that um, with anything other than the real thing. That is a truly magical moment. I also think what's a magical moment is kind of, you know, I try to make things, something I, I talk about often in interviews is being aware of not just that side of the process, but what happens between, between, the recording of the music and the ears of your audience, meaning that there's going to be a mixing process. There's going to be a dubbing process. So you're going to mix the music and it used to be much simpler where you just record an orchestra and it was mixed, but now you have synthesizers. Maybe we have different bands coming in choirs and we have to deliver what we call um, stems because they want to be able to remix elements at the dub stage later. The dub stage is where all the, sound of the movie comes together they mix the dialogue with the sound effects with the foley which is like footsteps and sword clinking and whatnot glasses clinking that sort of thing and and then music and so all these sounds are being mixed together to create the final movie the final film whatever you want to call it tv show final thing and so if you have an understanding of how that process works and the different people involved, the mix engineers, the music editor, and you understand how to deliver for that, you can hopefully reach a point where on a project where you have a good relationship with the filmmaker and that team, you could really have a magical experience in the movie theater. And this is something that it, hap it doesn't happen very often because there are so many moving pieces politics, film the producers, studios, remixing, rewriting. They might take a cue that you wrote for this scene and put it in a different scene. So there's stuff that happens after you're there. But on a, on a project where you have a, a, a truly harmonious relationship with the filmmaker and that team, you get to a place where you sit in the theater 
and you feel like you're a, a part of something way bigger than yourself that you've made something and you've you've built it for this specific experience. You know, you haven't just built a soundtrack. That's in my mind, that's easy. I could sit here and make music all day and put it on Spotify, you know, easy. It's much harder to thread the needle, to, to run the gauntlet of all these different things that come together and sit in the theater and say, sound effects are playing, dialogue's playing, and the music's playing, and it's a wonderful, amazing experience. That, to me, is a true test, and I'm still, uh, you know, you could interview me in 50 years, and I'll still be trying to figure out how to do it, um, but 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 that's the goal. That's the goal I have. It's not easy, and, and it, it is amazing that the few times in my life where we've been able to thread that needle and make it happen, it is truly amazing. How would you describe yourself as a composer? Mm. You know, I, 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 I view myself as a composer, as a, hmm. I view myself as like, almost like a conductor of sound, you know, like I'm, there was this, there's a great conducting exercise that you usually do when you first take conducting class. And generally a conducting class is usually like 10, 20, 30 people. And they ask you, what instrument do you play? And they ask you to bring in your instrument. And so when I'm so so they'll do this exercise where if it's my turn, I stand in front of the group and everyone's playing the instrument, all the rest of the class, and there's no music or anything, but I have to try to in real time, like call upon people to deliver a sound, you know, so so if you know there's a trombonist over there, I might look at them and say, and you know, and 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 there's a musical language to that, right? I used to play trombone. If, I, if someone looked at me and said, <laughs> you know, I would, I, I know what to play. I was like, oh, okay. Bah, you know, like I'd give them that sound. Or if I said, you know, like there's, or, you know, if I look at the trombone and say, oh, you know, or, <laughs> you know, so, so it's funny. How would I say that? Like conductor of sound, conductor of, you know, I view myself as a composer. I'm trying to do that, but with a very different palette. And, and I'm trying, and I have a filmmaker standing behind me say, okay, Joe, I want it to be this. It's okay. Uh, I'm going to have two oboes and a clarinet and three cellos and a trombone. That's my musical palette and four synthesizers. Okay. Now everyone let's do this, you know? So, and sometimes, you know, sometimes what's fun about my job, sometimes there's a singer, there's a soloist, there's a, an artist I'm working with who I have to, what are, what are they trying to do? How are we going to work together? You know, I think it's like a conductor of sound. Maybe that's, that sounds like a romantic thing to say. I'm a conductor of sound. But 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 for a filmmaker, you know, I, I have a I have someone bossing me around, you know, so that makes it more complicated. When it comes to genres, what are your favorite types of projects to work on? I, you know, I actually have a film coming out in a couple of weeks. I, I it's a pretty mature film, so I, I, I think you could probably watch it, but <laughs> it's called Spiderhead. It's going to be on Netflix and it is actually in one of my favorite genres to do, which is psychological thriller. Like I love being able to. Um, lead people on and fool people and take people on a journey and get people excited and add tension and drama. And it's a bit of sci-fi too, which is also a favorite, like that allows you, I feel like sci-fi allows you to mix media in a way that's really interesting. So like I'm, I have a lot of acoustic instrumentation, but I also have a lot of uh, synthesized instrumentation. I have a lot of vocals and I've manipulated the vocals digitally. So that's another interesting thing that that genre allows me to do. It allows me to really kind of use all these things that I have learned. Like uh, one thing I didn't mention earlier is not only was I playing in those bands when I was younger, but I was a big computer dork and synth geek. So I loved playing, making music in the computer. So not only was I playing in youth orchestras, but I was making music on a, you know, a crappy old PC. So I think that that is the reason I love psychological thriller and especially like with a sci-fi tilt is because it allows me to use all those tools and, 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 and really synthesize something that feels to me like something I'm the strongest at. A couple more general questions before I move into like more specifically. Sure, so, sure. Um, what in your mind makes like a really good score? You know, if it's if it's compelling and, and I guess compelling is a weird word, if it if it if it envelops you in the movie a little bit more, I think meaning that 
it feels unique to the film and it keeps you engaged with the film. I think that is, it's funny. I used to say when I was much younger that, oh, you know, good score is transparent. It allows the film to sing. But I also feel that that's underselling how important and vital music is and how effective it can be. So I, I, I often say like, I want the music to be a vital living part of the storytelling that it, 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 it completes the movie, so to speak, that without the score, the film would be a lot weaker. That to me, a compelling score or, or a good score or a successful score is something that uh, helps the movie deliver on what it's trying to do. If you could work with anyone in the industry, who would you work with? You know, it's, uh, let's see, you know, there was, there was an amazing singer years ago. Oh, he just passed away. It made me so sad. I really wanted to work with Bill Withers someday just because I love his music so much. He, he has this elegant simplicity and soulfulness. And he has such an amazing story where he was, you know, in the military, I think. And then he was like building airplane parts. He was working in a factory in LA and he just started singing and he'd have this little band and he'd all of a sudden like he becomes a a big star but he always had this hum humility about him because of his roots and so i always wanted to I, I feel similar not in any way that i was in the military or or building airplanes or anything but just the the thought that you know my parents were teachers my whole family is very it's a very humble family i i come from and i approach music that way with this humility and this service and so I, I find there's something resonant about that. He was, so, he was someone I really wanted to work with. And I think people like that is what connects it. It's very hard in Hollywood to find those type of people because Hollywood is full of crazy egos and crazy people. So I, I tend to harmonize with people who really approach it like storytelling first and kind of we're all, we're all like really just excited to be here and excited to make something that hopefully connects with the audience. Those are the people I want to work with. And I'll try to think of more good examples. <laughs> I think that's the perfect transition to move into stuff that you've worked on. I'm going to start with TV shows and then I'll move to movies. You have like a huge list of stuff, so I can't even begin to like cover, but I'll, I'm going to start with um, The Witcher and I'm wondering how you approached it when you first started working on it, especially coming in on season two, similarly to how you first came into the Divergent series in the second installment. Yeah, it's, it's a big challenge, right? Coming in as the second one in the door, you know, because you don't want to rock the boat. You don't want to you know what I think one of the worst things to do if I was like, well, new guy, I'm going to do something even cooler. I'm going to do something completely different and put my stamp on it. And I think that's, that's a little ridiculous. I, th I think for me, again, like it goes back to the what, why did you hire me? What am I here to do? What am I here to be helpful with and focusing on that? And for Witcher, um, you know, my first talk was all about story. It's like, hey, moving forward, second season, we want the score to be story focused. We want to be focus on telling the story of these characters and we like the language that we started in season one, the harmon the, the musical language. So we don't want you to come in and just re reinvent the wheel, but like we want you to really focus on delivering something that speaks to these characters, speaks to this story. And so that was my focus. The thing that was really hard about season two that I'm hoping we, um, that, that I'm already actively trying to improve for season three and beyond is like, I feel like we were all in quarantine for season two, like uh, just pandemic related stuff. So I didn't have as much live musical content as, as I wanted. Um, so uh, I feel like there's a lot more we could do to connect to the Polish roots of the Witcher. And so that's something I'm really like trying to trying to hone in on and get myself out of the studio, you know? And I think that's season two is really about just, learning the story, reading the books, reading the scripts, getting up to speed, similar in a way you had mentioned Divergent was reading those books, understanding that story, connecting with that character. You know, a lot of what I do, I jokingly say I'm like a method composer. I'm trying to live in the world that, that, that we're operating in. So the music speaks to the characters and the story at a visceral level. It's not just decoration that you add later. And if I'm going to give myself one critique for The Witcher, I think, I think season two, I think there were some moments that could have lived more with the story and that feels a little decorative. And that's something I'm working on for upcoming seasons is like really just 
entrenching myself even more in the characters and in the story and in the sound i think the sonics but anyway yeah that was that was a huge challenge because i'm trying to be respectful like we use some of the themes from season one i've no it's not that's not a problem with me I'm trying to be respectful of the world that was created yet i'm the new guy like everyone else is like season two yeah we know how this is done and i'm like i don't know how any of this is done how are we doing this i'm like relearning things but you know that's where the spirit of collaboration is so great like you know the producers were so welcoming always answering questions joey the actor we'd be just like this on zoom i think we're supposed to zoom later this week to talk about stuff for upcoming seasons because because we're trying to they're trying to get me up to speed and 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 make sure that i'm in the family and creating great music for them as well and and that's something that really i learned very quickly in la and in hollywood is forget the egos forget all that stuff everyone's generally just trying to make something good and so if someone's behaving badly because of their ego whatever let's forgive them because they're they're just trying to make something good and maybe they're feeling a little insecure luckily there was no one like that on the witcher everyone was just there was no ego involved so like let's just make something but but that's something i learned very early on is like hey we're all just trying to make something great and any um any creative differences or conflicts that we might have is 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 all in service of that. So you very quickly remove your ego, remove your your uh, insecurities from that, and say, "Hey, I just need to focus on delivering something great for this." So anyway, that applies to so many other projects, including you know Divergent series. You know? Well, what was it like evolving the theme? You've described it as that in the past. So what was it like evolving the theme throughout the season? You you know the the big thing about season two for me was witnessing kind of something that I'm going through similarly now is like, I'm starting to feel like a much older human and going through family stuff and becoming an adult and, and becoming more responsible. And I think that's what these characters are going through. I feel like in season one, we were introduced to their amazing powers, right? You know, wow, girl can do all this amazing stuff. Yen has all this, ma- she's been trained in magic. Siri has this amazing raw gift, you know, of uh, that she represents this powerful thing that ha- that is passed down through her lineage, right? I think season two was all these characters dealing with the weight of that or the loss of that or or being having to channel that in a way and i think i was i feel like i was dealing with that a little bit myself personally of like just getting older and learning how to be more res, res, more responsible with my power or not that i'm a superhero but uh, but just becoming a more responsible adult i think i think and, and and i think the big one for me was Geralt becoming a dad essentially mm-hmm. you know that obviously he he's technically not serious dad but he basically is and 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 weighing that with his desire to be this badass monster slayer and and protect protect uh, humanity from uh, the from these monoliths that are spitting out monsters you know how's he gonna but how's he gonna do that and be a dad and protect his daughter you know like that is such a a, a universal thought that perhaps you'll experience one day uh, maybe you could talk to your parents about that but yeah it's 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 to, to me, there was so much that resonated in that, that it was less about, I don't know, it was less about saying, okay, I'm going to modulate the theme from this key to that key. It was more about how do I make this theme feel older and wiser and more um, more impactful and more deep, I guess. I, I don't know. I feel like season one, season one was like really kind of exciting and energetic. And I obviously I don't want to lose energy for season two, but I felt like season two, we had a chance to get deeper and more more spiritual in a way if that makes sense you said that you love um medieval music and that you've always wanted to find a way to incorporate that music that harmonic and instrumental language into your scoring so what was it like finally being able to explore that with the witcher very difficult i mean the thing about medieval music you know there's a certain there's certain scales there's certain keys there's certain instrumentation that all work against scoring you know scoring is very fluid you have to match certain keys you have to match certain instrumentation from one scene to the next and so a lot of medieval instruments are meant to be featured and play in certain keys and be played a certain way and to uh, you know so i have to one thing i'm doing right now is i'm trying to i'm trying to meet in the middle of like 
understand and learn about these instruments. So before I commit music to paper, I'm understanding what these instruments can and can't do, and I'm designing the music for them so it allows them to shine. You know, uh, Western classical music, quote unquote, obviously a very broad term, you know, especially like classical music from the 1600s on was about equalizing all the keys. This instrument can play in all the keys. This instrument can play very lyrically at any volume, can play with any sort of singer or instrument. Medieval music is, hey, there, these instruments can play at this volume, in this key, and in this way, in this octave. Like, that's all you got, you know? So I think, I think, I think, I think that's the biggest challenge for me is being able to literally harmonize that with, you know, scoring is more subtle, more underscore, more, uh, it's hard, it's hard. And I'm trying to do it in a way that, you know, you then factor in getting music approved and rewriting and, re and you know, budgeting for recording. It gets very complicated, but I'm trying to, trying to master all these little moving pieces. It's not easy. I'm very grateful to have a team to help me. Um, uh, and it goes back to the point of being in LA that everyone's on the team trying to help you, trying to help get something done. So well, what's it like evolving a score for particular characters as certain characters evolve throughout the season and focusing on those different aspects? You know, it's like, I don't think about, it's funny. I'm, you know, I'm much more spiritual about it. I, I don't think like, oh, this character wants this. So the music has to be this. But I do try to shape the music to the general idea of like, where's this character going? What's this character trying to do? What's this character's destiny or what is their perceived destiny? So I think I'm writing their themes when I come into a season or come into a project and I'm starting early and writing a theme. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of that character's best self, right? Like what is this character's best self what are they trying to become what does this character represent what type of emotions and sensibilities um, does this character represent and that hopefully comes forward in the music i'm writing for them but then the exciting thing is as you go through the season how you you know the season is a journey of how this character becomes that or is trying to become that and is foiled and has to become something else or is or is defeated and has to do this and has to you know work with someone else so, you know so all of a sudden now the music for one character becomes the music for three characters and so it's this constant evolution of this uh, not to give an illusion that this is the way I think, but, you know, there's something I think about a lot is, you know, the platonic ideal, you know, Plato had this theory where, you know, uh, for every object in the world, this, there's the ideal version of that object. So when I am writing a theme for Siri or writing a theme for Alina in Shadow and Bone or writing a theme for Triss, you know, in, in, in Divergent or whatever, you know, I, or, or like, wait, uh, what's, what's Shailene's character's name in Divergent? Not Triss. Triss is in Witcher. It is, uh, sorry, it's been a while since I did a Divergent movie. But anyway, the idea, I'm, I'm writing the platonic ideal music for that character. And then the way that music evolves is based on that character's evolution in the, you know, whether it gets more serious or more light or more substantial or, or, more, or more aggressive, you know, like that's, those are the types of, decisions I'm making based on the character's own decisions and the, the story we're telling. You mentioned Shadow and Bone, so that's like the perfect transition to that. How did you approach Shadow and Bone when you first started working on that? That was another case where I got really lucky where, you know, one of the first things I did on that was sit down with the author. And, and, and you know, so many times when you work on a project as a composer, you never meet anyone other than uh, the director and some producers or something. So that was a fortunate case where, yes, I met the producer. Yes, I spoke with the director, but I also met the author. And we, we got to just talk about what is the true source of these, of the inspiration for these characters. So my music was not just coming from, you know, what, what we saw on screen, but also just what is the genesis of these characters, which I, th I thought was really cool and, and really fun to be able to do that. Sometimes it doesn't work like that. Sometimes that you have to always be open as a film composer to be wrong, I think, by doing that. Like, for instance, I talk a lot about in Shadow Bone has, I was so wrong about the Shadow Fold. The first theme I wrote for the Shadow Fold was this kind of ambient, mysterious, like 
kind of like we go into this like a uh, weird world and then you see it on screen and it's like the death star it's like this imposing thing and there are these creatures that are going to come eat you and so that music had to change i had to throw away what i did initially and completely rethink that reimagine that and i've already started writing themes for the for the next round of characters that we get introduced to and i have a feeling i'm gonna throw some of them away because like the fact is these characters might be different on screen than what we imagine in the book so it's it's just a real it's a real adventure what i do and i, I love it and i'm uh, i'm i try to you know i'm open to reinventing myself as we go along but it's also really rewarding when you start early and you 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 create something with such an artistic integrity that somehow makes it through and carries it it, it shows you're doing something right so it's 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 a, i guess that's one of the rewarding things too one of your earlier questions you know I think one of the the great things about the score for Shadow and Bone is the amount of tension that you're able to build, especially in the fold like you're talking about. How do you approach like the ending of a series, like the climax? You know, ah, uh, it's <laughs> there's no science to any of this. You know, it's 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 you know, I'm just hoping that it, you know one thing that actually this something great to talk about is the evolution of the Darklings theme. You know, I had written basically the music for the darkling is is really intertwined with the grisha i call it like the darkling grisha music because he really you know he at, at the beginning of shadow bone he represents all the grisha he's kind of the leader of the grisha and and so there's this very and to me the first version i wrote of that music is very layered there's a lot of layers of gamelan and strings and um percussion and as the season goes on and we get to see the learn more about the darklings past a lot of these layers start peeling away and and and, and one of my favorite things to work on was the opening of episode seven in the first season was basically the backstory of how the darkling became the darkling and the music becomes really simple and it's like a solo bass and a drum or like just the gamelan with a string you know and it's just you start to get the essence of the character. And so it was really fun that, look, I'm not thinking as I write, like, oh, I'm going to strip all the music back because this is the essence of the character. It kind of happens more intuitively, but it's it's fun to look back at that and be like, oh, that's so interesting how I naturally evolved that character's music to get more and more simple as the season went on because we are getting more and more into the crux of this character what makes this character you know so compelling is these few simple things versus at the beginning of the season the music is much more weird and mysterious and layered because he he is that much more of a mystery to us so we're discovering more and the music gets simpler so i thought that was really poetic and and interesting to talk about before moving into movies, can you tell us what we can expect score wise in season two? No, I cannot. You're going to discover it with everyone else. I, you know, honestly, I think, I think, I think the big challenge for me is I feel like season one was so much fun and so much, um, we developed such a cool harmonic and, 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 and musical, just musical language that how do we keep the bar up? How do we, how do we keep doing that for our new characters? But how do we also, make sure our old characters get plenty of love too. So something I focused on a lot as we get ready for season two is how do we evolve the themes for our main characters, that it's not just taking their music from season one and playing it again, you know, this is not the greatest hits. How do we, how do we take where Alina was in season one and relate it to where she is in season two, you know, so it's the same music, but it's different. So that's the big challenge for me. And I'm, I'm really eager to get, to share that but not yet <laughs> <laughs> well moving on to movies the greatest showman what was it like working on the greatest showman that was that was a really difficult project because it lasted a long time there were a lot of people involved there were a lot of different uh, music producers and and you know luckily we had two great songwriters pask and paul um we had one great filmmaker michael gracie um you know so there was there was a certain constancy there thank goodness but it was a real challenge because i started on that movie my first meeting was 2014 oh, wow. and so that film came out at the end of 2017 you know it was really 2018 when it took off so it was almost four years on and off i obviously i i i couldn't work on one project alone for four years i think i'd go crazy 
but it was a lot of like, I worked a bunch in 2014, 2015, went away for a little while. They had other people come in, work on stuff. I got a call 2015. I can't remember. It was 2015, 2016. We're shooting. Can you come help with Never Enough? You know, so I was actually on set for Never Enough and I helped lay out the orchestra and, and do the orchestration for that and develop that. And then I went away and I didn't hear anything for months. And then I come back and, hey, we're finally wrapping this up. Can you help finish the production for these songs? So it was it was a real challenge just purely from a logistical um, uh, just being being calm and patient and dealing with different music producers, different needs for for both the studio and the album and the and the movie itself versus what the singers were doing and and oh it was it was a challenge and the goal hopefully it really is amazing that that project just took off and became a part of people you know my I have a nephew who I think dressed up as, you know, Hugh Jackman for like a whole year, you know, and and and, and it was amazing to see that because, um, you know, you put so much blood and sweat into these things and you sometimes wonder, is anyone ever going to see this? Is anyone ever going to care, you know? Um, and, and, you know, a little Hollywood lesson for you, you know, the, it was very interesting when that film came out, it was a big flop at first, you know? And I was still proud of it. I said, hey, this music is really cool. You know, no problem. And every there were so many people who were involved with the movie at that point who just like disowned it, who were like, oh, you know, I, I had nothing to do with that movie. And then a week or two later, you know, it starts climbing up and it's selling all these records. And all of a sudden it's the number one movie and it's a huge movie. And there are so many people who come out and say, I'm the reason that movie was successful. And, you know, it goes to that old saying, forgive my language, you know, uh, success has a thousand fathers, but failure is a bastard child, you know, and uh, I think it's interesting for me because I know what I did for Greatest Showman. I know I did a lot of really great legwork for that and help prop it up and help really get it there. But it's interesting because I just I'm very humble about it. I just sit back, enjoy enjoy the music enjoy it out there there are so many people who are like i'm the reason that greatest showman succeeded and it's like i guess you were congratulations sure you know and i'm sitting here going well what did i do i just worked for you know four years on and off of some of the most key moments of the film but what do i know you know so it's very interesting and it's and it, and it was a big uh journey for me it was a big psychological challenge to deal with to deal with the whole time I mean, that was that was a really difficult project and hopefully it feels effortless hopefully it feels like it wasn't difficult at all and it was just magical um so well there you have it <laughs> It's such a touching, magical score. What do you like? You worked on it for so long. Do you have any favorite memories that stick out to you from working on it? I do, I do, and I think they were all, you know, very early on. You know, one of the one of the coolest things about filmmaking, if you if you, I my fondest memories I think are the early meetings I had where I was with Pascal and Paul, and we were just looking at the music for the first time. And, and it was seeing this magic. I mean, those songs are magical and I'm going, wow, hopefully I could take really great care of this and not screw it all up and just deliver something that feels um, inspired because, you know, the way Pask and Paul work, you know, they're very old school They're you know, they're coming with like piano vocal. Maybe they have a little demo with percussion or a string quartet or something, but it really is simple, direct elements so it was up to me the songs that we did together like whether it was never enough or tightrope um or million dreams i had to like figure out how is this song going to exist in the movie like how am i going to take this from piano vocal into full production and that was a magical point in time because it really was about discovery discovering sounds discovering how this music was going to live beyond piano vocal you know and 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 it was a great test of metal uh, of, of of one's metal because um if i'm using that word correctly just because it was it went through so many different iterations and other people had their hands in it and it and it and at the end you're dealing with all this politics of a film coming together and when i got the call to come back in at the end and really help finalize the movie and work with john debney on the score and really just kind of help deliver the final productions for the film i had to like just do my best to clear out all the politics and the noise that was going on and just think about that 
the magic, that first meeting, those first few meetings we had where it was just me, Pasc and Paul, Michael Gracie. Uh, we had an amazing uh, music supervisor from Fox, Anton Monstead, where it's just, and, and, and it was funny because we were like the, they weren't Fox. I don't think loved the movie. They were like doing the movie as a favor for Hugh Jackman. So we were like, kind of just kind of out there like, ah, oh, whatever they're doing. So we were kind of left to our own devices. And it was only at the end when Hugh Jackman was so involved and egos and all that. Not, not, he was the nicest guy, by the way. I'm going to be very clear. He was the nicest human being in the world. I'm not saying his ego. It's more of like just the general ego of making a big movie that costs a lot of money and is a big, you know, has, has the potential to succeed or fail. It got really difficult with the politicking. So, um, you know, what it became about at the end for me was just closing my eyes and taking a few deep breaths and really just trying to remember the magic that is in these songs and delivering on that. And it was not easy. It was really difficult. And um, there were a lot of people. I remember doing these late night sessions with orchestra and there were a lot of people in the booth kind of suggesting different stuff. And, you know, it, it was very very confusing in a way, but it was also, it made me feel alive because I said, I'm here because I represent what helped brought the, this music to life at the beginning. So I'm going to try to help preserve that magic and see it through to the end. So I don't know, hopefully, I, I, I hopefully, I don't know. I don't know what I hope. I do. I, I, I'm just glad to be part of something, you know, like it's amazing when the phone rings, Joe, we need you to we want you to be a part of this magical thing. It's like, great. Thank you so much. Let's, let's go make magic. <laughs> no magic movie is the, the live action Lady in the Tramp. Oh. <laughs> what was your experience working on that and your approach to working on, like, reimagining such, like, a classic Disney movie and story? It was very similar to way because, you know, we didn't have Pask and Paul, but we had these amazing songs from 1955 um, that we had to preserve what made that film unique while also obviously connecting to a younger audience being more aware of, of what we're so so the biggest the biggest difference which was a lot of fun you know when you look at those classic disney movies and, and there's nothing wrong with this they were really a product of their time meaning that lady and the tramp was made in 1955 and the music is like 1955 like that style of music however the story is like early 1900s America. And so the first thing that the director and I did, and this is where I got lucky, that filmmaker is a close friend of mine. We've done several projects together. We get along great. And so before we had a real production meeting or did anything, we just went to our local bar <laughs> and just had a drink and just were like, what's, what's the music in this movie doing? Like, what are we trying to do with the music in this movie? And the, 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 the two things that we really came up with where a we wanted the music to be of that time so rather than you know disney 2019 we wanted to be 1910 new orleans or 1910 southern u.s you know and so that set us off on this whole journey of connecting with the authentic music of that era and working with musicians who can truly represent the authentic music of that era so we went to new orleans and recorded some amazing musicians who you know half of them don't even read music because they grew up playing clarinet or trombone from a very early age in that style they don't need to read music they're just playing um uh, they they just know what to do because they're so ingrained in that style and so i just had to let that magic happen and record it and and obviously guided I'm, I'm not just saying i'll do whatever we came and said this is what we're trying to do we recorded like we recorded he's a tramp that classic song but in that style and so we were able to use that in the film a little bit the other thing we wanted to do was you know i my whole pitch to charlie our, our filmmaker was hey you know at that point in time music wasn't just a a spotify it wasn't just it the only way to have music was to have a piano in your house or to go see a musician. Like there was not this easy way to like hang with music. You had to, music was, so music was alive. Music was live and living. And so I wanted to make sure, obviously there's a certain element to the score that feels like that, but that we hear the musicians, that's a real, there's a real patina to the score that feels alive, but also that 
the music is in the film. So he actually wound up making the main characters like they play music on screen and there is a harmonica player on screen and that and there is just there's this on screen musical presence. So, you know, that film, I wish I wish more people saw that movie. I don't think many people saw the movie. And it's always heartbreaking when you feel like the movie doesn't connect at a certain level. But at the same time, I'm still, like you said, very proud of the magic we created because I feel that you know, we put a stamp on it that gave it a right to exist. I think one of the danger things, dangerous things, when you quote unquote do a remake or revisit an old property or an old franchise or whatever is not give it a reason for being. And mm-hmm. I feel like in terms of the musical identity, in terms of the amazing people we work with, and I, and I haven't even yet, yet mentioned Janelle Monet and her team, Nate and Roman, who are part of the new Cat song, and he's a tramp, you know, between everything that I was just talking about with Charlie about New Orleans and the living music. And then you bring in Janelle Monet. You have this, this thing where we've created something for this film that hopefully we've given this film and this music a reason to be. And uh, I'm really proud of it. So yeah, that's, it goes back to something else I was saying where I could only control so much of what I do. You know, I can't control whether something's a hit. I can't control whether something sells a million copies or makes a billion dollars at the box office. All I can control is, hey, how do we tell this story through music? I'm the musical person. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, make the best music possible for what you're trying to do. Let's go do that. Try hopefully make some magic that connects with people. And it, I, I, it, it makes my day, Olivia, when you say like, hey, you know, Lady and Tramp, that was really magical. Let's talk about it. It's like, oh, it connected with people. That's great. I'm so happy definitely did and a couple last questions for you here i know we've been covering a lot of ground this is kind of a different project but it does bring us back to kind of like where you started out and um what you listened to as a kid what was it like working on star wars tales from the galaxy's edge what was that like for you oh you know it's a little intimidating right you know you go how am i going to but but you know it's also very to me that intimidation is also very freeing and 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 i have to thank um, uh, it was Kevin Bolin, who's like the music supervisor slash audio implementation guy who was overseeing this, who we just, we just had a meeting every week and we established very early on, very early on that he wanted me to be honest with myself musically, that I wasn't trying to create John Williams. I wasn't trying to create you, I, what he wanted me to do. And what they wanted me to do was to be my own musical identity, which that instantly freed me to deliver something that, first of all, I wanted to be inspired by Star Wars. So I did allow some of that music, as as you could hear in the soundtrack, you know, that music wouldn't exist without John Williams and Star Wars. But at the same time, there's so much music there that John Williams would have never done something like that, or John Williams would have never made that decision. And, and, And so I feel like I was able to put a stamp on my little tiny corner of the Star Wars universe. And that's very freeing. And so, yes, I definitely at first was very intimidated and uh, paranoid and (laughs) insecure and concerned. But that quickly went away because, you know, we, I was very honest. Like, I'm not trying to be John Williams. I'm not going to try to do that. If I try to do that, I'm going to fall on my space and fail because I'm not that guy. Um, so I could only be me. So how, let me run this through my brain, run this through how I think about stuff and then see if I can deliver something that feels unique to this world that delivers on the story and the, the concepts that we're trying to do. And I'm actually, it's awesome that you mentioned that because I'm really proud of it, proud of it. Yet another project. I don't know if anyone's paying attention to this stuff. There's obviously the big thing with VR, right? We're limited to whoever has an Oculus or a meta or whatever we're calling it these days. And so we have a limited audience, but I feel like as well, there's a business side, the business side of that for me is I jumped at this chance because I was like, I want to learn how to tell a story in VR. Like, this is so cool. I've never done this before. I did a VR film Mm -hmm. or like a short film, but I had never done a VR interactive experience. I was like, how is this going to work? I'm going to have to combine how video games work, which is we have to deliver music in a very modular way that can loop and, and be reassembled and whatnot. But I also have to think about the headphone environment i have i have a pair of headphones in the drawer over there that has this head tracker on it that works with a a 
a tool, a software tool, on my computer that allows me to replicate head movement in a VR space. And so you could tell from some of the earlier things I was talking about that I'm very passionate about not only understanding things from an artistic level, obviously that's very important of being an artist and coming with ideas and being creative, but also making sure I understand the technical thing we're trying to do so that that art can be more effective, if that makes sense. So that creativity can drill right into the storytelling and uh, tension and excitement mode of the brain and just be really effective. You know, if I, cause if I, I can write great music and great art all day, that's kind of what I'm trained to do. That's never a question, but the question is, can it be great and effective? Can it actually, and that, and that's what was so exciting about working on VR is I was learning how to make my music effective in a whole new environment. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite questions to ask, but I think I ask it to like every single person. And that is if you could give your past self a piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, I love that question because I asked that too when I when I when I was younger, you know, doing a lot of attending a lot of mentoring sessions. Like, oh, what would you do? Um, I, you know, I I try to not think about the past too much, but if I was going to rewind and like do some things over, I think I think I would listen more. I mean, I I definitely the older I get, the more I try to listen, the the less I try to talk. Obviously, today I'm I'm the <laughs> guest, so I'm doing a lot of talking, but I try to, you know, I think. I think also like quiet confidence is a lot in this business. I think it's interesting. You know, I think I'm always walking this tightrope between I want to be confident and, and compelled to do what I do, but I'm always learning. I'm always like under trying to understand, like I'm always trying to be better and trying to, and I think I want to get better at learning when to be both. Cause there are times when um, filmmakers look to me to be more confident to like, I can deliver this and I can do this. And this is what we should do at this point in time. And that's a very difficult thing to learn and to be good at, to know at what point in the production to be delivering and more confident and at what points to be more open and learning. And there's some times in the past where I think I was doing one instead of doing the other. And that was a mistake. So I think, you, you, you know, I'm trying to get better at knowing when I need to listen, when I need to talk, when I need to be absorbing things and learning things and when I need to be confident and projecting stuff. And I think that's part of what it means to be a composer right now, because it's, you know, we have this romantic idea. I'd, I'd be curious. I want to hear what you think of the word composer. Cause I think when I was younger, you know, when you think of the word composer, the, imp the imprint is always, Oh, some mad genius with crazy hair sitting in a room writing music. And then, you know, the, the music comes out of the room and it's amazing. Whereas what I do is so much more collaborative. What you do as a film composer that um, you have to be, such a collaborative person and and you have to be spiritually engaged with this project like you know that old-fashioned way of being a composer you know i feel more like a, a a producer like if you if you read about rick rubin and other great music producers half of it is psychology you know they're engaging with the artist and learning what the artist wants to accomplish and helping the artist get to a place where they feel comfortable to perform and deliver something so i feel like I'm getting, I'm engaging the filmmaker and getting, hopefully getting them to a place where they could be truly open with me about what they're trying to deliver dramatically. And then I'm doing the same with the musicians. I'm doing the, the same with my, maybe if there's a songwriter, I'm, I, so I feel much more like a music producer than a music composer. So if I were to like start over, I'd like maybe even spend more time, like, like learning about humanity and personalities and psychology and just i might even take acting classes because acting is such a, a great way to connect with humanity like understanding the human spirit so maybe i take some business classes i don't know you know it's easy to it's easy to sit back and say what one would do over again i also feel so tremendously fortunate to have threaded the needle to be where i am today and that also tells you what i'm thinking about today i'm trying to get better at better at understanding my place in the production process and understanding how to maximize my skills and tools and allow, allow, allow me, my music to exist in a way that really uh, is confident and delivers. I, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to talk about sometimes, but yeah, that's, I hope that's simple enough to comprehend. It's, it is. This is <laughs> last question for you. Oh, here. It's okay. Yeah. I know you have um, uh, Spiderhead, which comes out June 17th, and, and you work on Shadow and Bone, you're working on The Witcher. Can you tell us, just tell people what to look forward to, what to look out for you coming up? 
Is there anything you want to like that you're currently working on that you can talk sure. about? Sure. There's another, there's another project that comes out in July called America the Beautiful. And it's, uh, it's on Disney Plus, it, but it's Nat Geo. And it's, um, it's all about the different wildlife of America. But it's a really unique way of telling the story of the wildlife of America. It's, it's like a very engaging human way of telling. It's hard. For, I'm still trying to wrap my head around how best to talk about it because I've just been living in it for the last couple of years. And I think there's something special about the music to me because it's so many nature series. You watch the series and you could kind of predict, like mm -hmm. I just watched a new one that I found a little annoying because it was, it's like, oh, it's David Attenborough again. And the music is like really symphonic. And, you know, there's something great about that. Don't get me wrong. There's something timeless and beautiful about David Attenborough's delivery as a narrator and the, the symphonic music. But I feel like our, our, our series really connects to the human spirit of America in that we've connected with so many different cultures and peoples and um, spirits. And like, we try to tell the story through different specific animals and, 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 and how they, they are being heroic in their own way. I don't know. There's, I'm going to get better at talking about it. I am a musician after all. I'm not so good at talking. If you're going to go to acting school, you could teach me how to be a better talker, but, uh, but I, I, that's something I'm really proud of too. And I had never done a project like that. So it was really interesting to be immersed in that. Um, and so, yeah, that comes out in July, busy, busy year ahead. My goodness. Th those two are done, thankfully, but I have a lot more cooking um, that I'm excited to share with you soon, hopefully. Perfect. Thank you so much for answering all my questions. Thank you for the great questions, Olivia. You made it easy.